few more people. That's so fine. They might dribble in here after we get underway. But I wanted to welcome everyone this morning to our monthly breakfast forum. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have a good program for you coming up. Rick Van Wickler <coughs> is here from the Cheshire County Jail, and he's going to be presenting um, us an update on the construction process and uh, some other valuable information. Before we get started, I wanted to thank our, our uh, sponsor for today's program, the Nanak Radio Group, and also thank Bentley Commons, who is our host um, for our monthly breakfast forums, and also a big thank you to Bill Reeves for the video <coughs> video videotaping the program so that it can play back on Channel 8 Cheshire TV. Uh, after today's program, Bentley Commons will have uh, a representative here to take you on a tour of the facility if you have not yet uh, seen some of the rooms. It's very interesting and very nice. Um, and then after the presentation, Rick will entertain some questions, and uh, so feel free to interject during his presentation or afterwards. Um, and uh, I'm sure he'll stick around if there's any one-on-one -on -one conversation that uh, you would like to instigate as well. So, with no further ado, I would like to give you a little bit of background um, on Rick. He has been the superintendent of the Cheshire County Department of Corrections since June of 1993. His corrections career began in 1987 at the Merrimack County, New Hampshire Department of Corrections. At the time that he was recruited by the Cheshire County Board of Commissioners, the jail uh, faced significant litigation in federal court, and he was challenged with uh, revitalizing an agency that was in need of training, structure, and professionalism. He holds a BS in management from Franklin Pierce University and is the co-recipient of the President's Community Partner Award from Antioch University Graduate School. So thank you, and let's welcome Rick. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to apologize in advance for my vo voice. If I'm a little bit hoarse, I've been up all night long. Uh, and I haven't done that in a while. So it feels kind of brings back old memories, you know, from days of old, being up late. Uh, but when you're in my line of work and you're up all night, that's not necessarily a good sign. Um, but anyway, we have those days. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and present to you today. And uh, what I'm here to talk to you about is the New Jail Project, give you a little bit about the history uh, of the project and bring you up to date where we are on it. Uh, our mission statement out there, you know, I, I look for a mission statement that's very uh, brief uh, and means a lot. Brief but yet means a lot. Uh, where positive correctional theory becomes positive pro professional practice. I chose this as our newest mission statement because when you go to the National Institute of Corrections, when you study about corrections or corrections theory, it's interesting to me that when you go visit jails, it is so vastly different from what you're supposed to be doing. And so what I wanted to do was take the message that we look at the academic side of what corrections is supposed to be in terms of positive theory and put it into practice because it works. And we've proven that in our county over the last several years. A lot of people, though they pay for a county jail, have no idea what it's all about. So what exactly do we do? Well, obviously we detain adult offenders and we're supposed to be a place of rehabilitation. Now in the New Hampshire system of corrections, the county is separate from the state. A lot of people don't understand this. We get no funding from the state. We get no oversight from the sheriff. Our command structure is simply this. We have an appointed superintendent who reports to the county commissioners. The county commissioners are considered the owner operator of the agency and the constituents of each county fund that operation. There's no assistance from the state or federal government to do that. Now that can be very good or it can be very bad depending on the administration and the Department of Corrections. It's either a license to abuse or it's an opportunity to fast track to professionalism. It depends who you have at the helm. So we are a place of adult detention. A lot of people think that the county jail is a place where you keep misdemeanant offenders, people who are there for minimum security crimes. Well, the reality is any crime that's committed in this county, once you're arrested, if you cannot make bail, you will go to the County Department of Corrections. That includes homicide. That includes armed robbery. Anything that you could be arrested for, you go to the local county Department of Corrections. That's 60% of our population. 
only 40% of our population is actually sentenced there for a misdemeanor crime. So you can see that has a significant impact on the type of operations in terms of security, in terms of the kind of people and talent that you have available, in terms of the type of security equipment that you have available, and training. Rehabilitation is difficult to achieve at a local level because when you look at the average length of stay, I emphasize the average length of stay, it's about 45 days. And I've often questioned, what can I do for somebody in 45 days that mom or dad has failed to do in 18 years? What sort of thing can we do in 45 days that will actually try to get you to shift your patterns of behavior? Now, while it seems like the odds are against you, we believe that we at least have to try. And so we do. But we don't try with taxpayer money. We use volunteerism to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we are a detention center. And I think that bullet everybody is well aware of. A lot of people don't understand that we're a community health center. We're a community health center because somebody who is mentally ill, whose behavior rises to a level of committing a crime, who is so aggressive that the hospital won't take them, and there's no place in the community that will take them, the jail is the safety net. Also, we know that 32% of our population is diagnosed with a mental illness. And there's no place in the community for these mentally ill people to go. Now, we have that mission while we're not funded to have psychiatric assistance uh, employed. And that's the way it's been throughout history. And so we slowly try to change that. Notice I reversed those two. I just dealt with mental health. Let's talk about community health. We're a hospital in a sense. We are held to certain HIPAA regulations. Obviously, people have medical care needs. We have a contract with Dartmouth, Hit Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center to provide health care to the offenders. We're going to look at some numbers and some, t some statistics on these two issues. So now you begin to see that it's not just a place to go for detention, but we're a health care provider and we're a mental health institution. And believe it or not, we're a school. And we're a school because there's federal laws that say if you are under the age of 21 and coded as learning disabled, then the government has a responsibility to make sure that you have a high school education, not a GED, not an equivalent. If you're coded as learning disabled under the age of 21 and incarcerated, you have a right to an equivalent high school education, which means that the special education department in the district of liability has to come to the jail and provide services for that student so that they can graduate with the rest of their class. Very, very sophisticated process. A couple of things has to happen here. One, the offender has to want it. And would you believe that none of them do? In my 18 years in Cheshire County, 23 years in this business, we had one offender in all that time take advantage of that federal law, actually receive those services after getting an assessment from the special education team and graduating with his class. One. And we process, as you'll see, about 1,700 inmates a year. It was back in 1997 when I first raised the issue that we have a problem in Cheshire County. Now remember that I am at the time fighting and trying to settle lawsuits. Several lawsuits that happened before my arrival that rose to a 1983 civil rights lawsuit in federal court. So Cheshire County was being sued for 14 different civil rights cases of abuse, lack of medical care, improper treatment, and so on. And so while I'm trying to manage that, the population begins to creep up by an average daily of 10 inmates every year. We're running out of room quickly. My first response back in about 1996 was to put spare bunks in every cell that I possibly could. Well, what that did is that took a cell that had enough space for one inmate and made it for two, and then made it for three. So where one inmate was supposed to be, we had three bodies. And the court has clearly ruled that the conditions of confinement like these can rise to a level of cruel and unusual punishment if not managed properly. So I knew this was a significant issue and we began to bring this to the Board of Commissioners and say this is a problem. Note that the rate 
of the institution is 47 inmates, and we have had as many as 132 in that building. To not be sued for that is nothing short of miraculous, in my view. And the credit for that goes all to the frontline employees that work in that institution, who are there round the clock and have to deal with the sophisticated behaviors and problems that they have out there in order to prevent situations that would rise to a level of litigation. So that's when it started. Over the next nine years, we threw, we being the county taxpayer, threw over $700,000 in studies trying to get to, no, we don't have to build another jail. Or if we have to build another jail, it doesn't have to be very big. And the answers kept coming back inconsistent with what a lot of people wanted to hear. Every report said there's no no-cost options, ladies and gentlemen. This will cost you. They said the current building is antiquated. It's not to standard. It's inadequate. It's insufficient. It's failing structurally. Expansion to existing building is not an option. In every single report of over $700,000 of just inquiry, every single one of these bullets appeared in every one of those reports. And yet, it still took a long time to get it done. Those reports recommended six changes. They said, if, if you really want to have a correctional system that is effective and efficient for the community, especially cost efficient, here's six things that you have to do. First, you need to establish a criminal justice council. And what exactly does that mean? It means little more than making sure that all the components of the criminal justice system talk to one another and sprinkle into there maybe some college professors and some business leaders that can help understand and discuss what's going on in this criminal justice community. Let's communicate. Let's be interconnected. That's what this means. Are we like that? Were we like that? We weren't like that, and we're still not like that. It's New Hampshire. <laughs> Local control. <clears throat> they said you have to design data collection information system protocols. We're in the year 2010. <laughs> I think you all know that. Technology is pretty darn good these days. In New Hampshire, there's about 227 towns, give or take a few. Most of those towns have a police department or an agency or a constable. Not many of them share the same software. District court has a different system of tracking cases than superior court does. Everything starts in district court and then bounds over to superior, but once that happens, electronically, they really can't talk to each other. And so you have a police department that arrests them, like, say, Keene. That's one database. District court then processes them. It's a second database. They can't talk to one another. It's a felony, so it's bound over to superior court. That's a third database. They can't talk to one another. And then they come to the jail, and I have my own system. That's the fourth database, and they can't talk to That's not a criminal justice system. That's a criminal justice non-system. Everybody likes to think they know what they're doing in their own lane, but they fail to understand that they're one part of a three-component system that really ought to be communicating and working together. It was 1997, and I was the president of the superintendent's affiliate in New Hampshire. We have an affiliate, so all 10 superintendents get together on a monthly basis and talk about our problems and, and lawsuits and challenges. And as the president in 1997, I knew that what was fast approaching was Y2K. And I knew that everybody was panicking about their software. And every single superintendent, all 10 counties, were shopping for software. And I'm thinking, what a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity because we can invest, literally, in one software system with one database and every single offender who passes through any county jail in the state of New Hampshire, we would have one database. We could 
query that information. We could develop ad hoc reports. We could apply for grants. We could add to the information technology and collection data systems for the entire state like never before in the history of the world. And we had the beautiful software package. It was $100,000. Of course, it was very expensive because it was so powerful. And it had been around, and this system actually runs the state of Maine. It runs the state of Virginia. It was wonderful. And I'm thinking for $100,000, let's see, I'm not quick at math, but there's 10 counties, 10,000 bucks a piece. For $10,000, you get a $100,000 software program. Everybody's looking for software. How about it, guys? What do you think? Not one taker. Not one. The other nine counties went off and they bought nine different systems. Three or four of those counties went to their inmate telephone provider who said, we can create a database for you. Well, yeah, if you know access, anybody can. <laughs> but it needs to be a little bit more than that. And anything that comes with free, I think we should be suspicious of. And so we went out and we went to our delegation and we said, you know, this sounds awful, but we need $100,000 for the software. It's going to take us way into the future. It's an investment now, but once we have it, we have it, and it's solid, and it's powerful, and we'll stand behind it. And they said, okay, because they understood the Y2K problem. So in 1999, we purchased that system. We started running it. We could run the courts. We could run police. We could run fire. We could run mutual aid. We could run all 10 counties and the state prison on that system, but we don't. We just run the county jail. And since 1999, that system has not gone down one time. Not one time has it gone down. It's been the most reliable system. It's had six upgrades. It's been phenomenal. And it integrates with everything that comes along down the pike. So in retrospect, a lot of these other jurisdictions are saying, gee, maybe we missed a good opportunity. And indeed they did 10 years ago, 11 years ago. The point, getting back to point, is you have to collect this data and know your criminal justice system if you're going to manage it effectively. Develop a court service department. Have pretrial services, day reporting centers, electronic home detention. I've been pushing electronic home confinement since I've been in this community. Because I don't think that every single person that I see in jail necessarily has to be in jail. I can tell you about a single mother who stole food that's in jail. I can tell you about a single woman who was arrested for criminal trespass because she was mentally ill, lost her job, couldn't afford her medication, was evicted from her apartment, refused to leave because she had nowhere to go, and so the police arrested her for criminal trespass and brought her to jail where she sat. I can point to an 82-year-old woman with Alzheimer's who was brought to jail for criminal assault. She spent 10 months in jail before we can get her out. And were it not for the other female prisoners, it would have been awful. Those female prisoners took care of that woman. They helped feed her. They helped change her. They helped clean her. Things that jailers are not trained to do. The women offenders of Cheshire County stepped up to the plate and took care of that woman. She should not have been in jail. Those are three cases about women, but you know what? There are many times more cases about men who are in jail that shouldn't be in jail necessarily. Jail should have a specified outcome. Going to jail means that when you leave jail, something should be different and it should be for the better. And if that can't happen, then you have to question if you're doing the right thing. Consider the fact that when an inmate goes to jail, the taxpayer will pay anywhere from $27,000 to $40,000 a year, depending on the jurisdiction. Can you imagine that? If we're going to spend thirty-two dollars or even $40,000 to keep somebody in prison for a year, how about if we write them a check to go to college? A blank check. Now you got to understand that's hitting me in the gut because I got a daughter graduating Norwich in a couple of weeks and I'm just dying with the debt that that girl racked up. But you see, where are our priorities? 
You go to college, you pay for it for the rest of your life. You go to jail, we pay for you. What's the outcome? On electronic monitoring, you pay us. On electronic monitoring, I don't pay your medical expenses. On electronic monitoring, I don't feed you. I don't do your clothing. On electronic monitoring, you have to be an adult. And the first bill that you're going to pay, you hear from me, is me. That's the first bill you're going to pay is your electronic monitoring bill. Because they always say, I can't afford it. I say, what do you mean you can't afford it? It's 20 bucks a day. That's too much money. I can't afford it. Well, let's take a look at your budget. Imagine the facial grimace we get when we say, look at your budget, what they do. And what, what comes out? You know, the cigarettes, right? the coffee on the way to work. Uh, gas money, because they like to cruise up and down Main Street, right? And all this other stuff. And you know, it's interesting when we go over a budget how they easily have $20 a day for electronic monitoring to pay us. And I'm still in their life 24-7. I know if they've been drinking. I know if they've been drugging. I know if they're home or not home. It works. Electronic monitoring has been an underutilized opportunity since I've been in this community and I've been hard selling it. Had a meeting with the judges a couple of weeks ago and we've got them to agree. One judge from a court that wasn't one in this town but one that's in our jurisdiction says to me, you have electronic monitoring? <laughs> Which upset me because we've been trying to sell it for years. So let's make it cost efficient. So we had it, we need to further develop it. A detox policy. Well, protective custody, we have a lot of people that are picked up for protective custody. You know, you're drunk and disorderly, you're making a nuisance of yourself, you're not arrested or charged with anything, but you're apprehended, put in a car, taken to jail, and I can hold you for up to 24 hours. Now, the detox policy in most communities is, and in the state of New Hampshire by statute, is the first thing that a police officer should do with a protective custody person is turn them over to a responsible, sober adult. If you can't find one of those, you bring them to a detox center. We don't really have one of those in the community either. And the third option is jail. Let me ask you, all due respect to my brother and sister law enforcement officers, how many of them do you think make a lot of phone calls for one and two? Not many, especially if it's like nine or 10 o'clock at night. Okay, it's just going to be a waste of time. So we go right to the third option, put them in the car, bring them to jail. That's fine. But that means we don't have an efficient detox policy in our community. And oftentimes the court will say to somebody who's in for a drug offense or an alcohol offense, you can only be released from jail if you go directly into a program. Guess what the programs don't have? Bed space. <coughs> We have a, a woman up in Westmoreland right now who has such an order. Now her minimum release date was almost a month ago, about four weeks ago. And I could keep her for another month, max her out. And typically we release people on their early release date if they've been of good behavior and showed some progress. But the court order says you have to go from jail to a program. We know after holding her four weeks past her early release date, there's no way she'll get into a program before she maxes out. And I sat with my case manager and I said, this is unnecessarily punitive on a person who's trying. Because I would hold her to her maximum date, even though she didn't deserve to be held that long, then I would release her into the community until she got a bed available in a rehab center. So we're releasing her now. But that's how the system costs you money, makes little sense to me, and doesn't have a positive effect on the offender. And that's what we should be focused on. Vertical prosecution simply means get attorneys involved sooner rather than later. You know, you arrest somebody, they can't make bail, they sit in jail for a month, and then they go and finally get appointed a public defender and then have to wait another two months before their first hearing. Now, Cheshire County has a great reputation for doing very well in this category. We do this well. 
Other counties in the state do not. So this is kind of a cookie cutter thing to every jurisdiction across the country. Establish vertical prosecution. Get inmates moving through the system as quickly as possible. And we do that pretty well. Develop and, and implement a case management plan. This first came to our attention in the year 2001. Last year, I was permitted to get a case manager for the first time. And that case manager has been doing a tremendous amount of wonderful work for us. One example of what a case manager does, this will get you. Let's say that we have an offender in the community for whatever reason, but he is an offender that receives Social Security disability, been re receiving it all his life. That's how he pays his rent, his food, and, and his bills. Well, he gets arrested and he comes to jail. If he is in jail for more than 30 days, all that federal aid stops. It stops. He now becomes a ward of you all and me, Cheshire County. We have to pay for him. And when we release him, if he has no idea how to reinstate those benefits, he won't get them. So he doesn't know to do the paperwork. He doesn't know where to go to get that assistance. If he doesn't reinstate it, he doesn't get the money. If he doesn't get the money, he doesn't get an apartment. He doesn't get food. So he steals or acts out or misbehaves in order to come back to jail. Locked into a psycho. What this case manager does is he evaluates each and every offender before release. Do you have a place to live? Do you have a ride? Do you have a plan for when you get out of here? Do you know how to reinstate your benefits? And this case manager will help them fill out that paperwork so when they finally get released, they'll have a check in the mail from the federal government again, causing or enabling them to continue their life the way they had before. There are three types of jail architecture that we should talk about. Linear intermittent, podular remote, and podular direct. Linear intermittent for the bars that you see in the movies. You know, good movies have bars, and they're always closed, and you got one guy, maybe two guys in there. And then, you know, here's a side note. Oftentimes, you'll see a, uh, an officer walking with a billy cup dragging along the bars. Have you ever seen this? Ding, 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 ding. Any of you know why they do that? I'm sorry? Just to be obnoxious. To be obnoxious. That's what everybody thinks. But there's actually a reason why they did that back in those days dragging the billy club along the bars. And the reason was, if you were sawing through one of those bars, that loose bar would have a different tone. Kind of like a glass that's half full or quarter full, it has a different tone. So they'd walk along, and as long as every bar sounded the same, it was a quick check. But as soon as they hit a bar that was a different tone, they would stop, investigate that bar closely, and usually find that it was being sawed through. So that's why they did it. But anyway, that's a linear intermittent design back in the 70s. And what we found out was that these people were very aggressive. You open that jail cell, and they want to fight. Because they had nothing but pent up energy. And so all these psychologists got together, and they said, we should have a podular remote design, which means a little community. So envision this, this area here as a community. And we have little cells that we can live in the back of the room. And during the day, we can come out, and we can sit here. And we can play cards, and we can read the newspaper together, we can talk, we can chat, tell each other about our problems. And then at night, we go back to our cell and lock down. That would be a safer community, they said. And then you'd have an officer every once in a while come through, make sure that, that you have uh, what you need, and make sure that everybody was here that's supposed to be here. That's why they called it remote. So the pod was an area that we all live, and remote was the officer coming through. And we did that through the 1980s. Now, in Westmoreland, we have the first phase out there, which is linear intermittent, and the second phase, which is podular remote. Two kinds of architectural designs in one building. Very complicated to manage, very difficult to learn, very unsafe conditions to be in, especially when one and two are designed for only 47 people or 50 people, and you have 132 in it. Then along comes Podular Direct, which is 1990s through the present. Podular Direct simply says, okay, we still have that concept of people being in an, in an open area like this. However, the difference is we're going to put a correctional officer in there 24-7. Correctional officer is never coming out. So you actually have a control panel inside there. And you know what? No walls, no glass, no bars. Wide open. 
So an inmate could walk right up here and knock my computer off the desk if they wanted to physically because there's nothing keeping them from doing it. The brave thing about Podular Direct is it now employs human relations into the mix. It presupposes that you can't manage people through glass, through doors, through metal. That it has to be mutual respect, that it has to be open confrontation. And when I first heard of this, Podular Direct, I'm thinking, how is this possible? How can this really work? But then I start thinking of my experiences. And I've had experiences where there would be an inmate inside of a cell banging so loud that you would think any moment they're going to come flying through that door. Because some of these are big guys. Bang, 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 and you'd hear a bang and you'd see the door just stressing, stressing from the kicking. And I would say to the control center, open the door. And they'd be like, what? I said, open the door. And when they open the door, what do you think happened? Instantly, the person would calm down. It's almost like road rage when you're in your car. You'll say things and do things inside of your car that you'd never do if you were out in a, in a room full of respectable people. All right? But once those barriers are taken away, you behave a little bit differently. And I thought, maybe there's something to this. And I went and I looked at different super, direct supervision jails and found there is something to this. And one of the principles is, we're not going to let an inmate be an inmate. Because inmates, they like to get into jail and say, this is my turf, this is my home, this is my territory, and you're here by invitation only. Direct supervision switches that around. It says, no, 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 you're a guest in the taxpayer's house. And you'll conform to the way we want things to go. Now, that being said, we meet their basic needs. We identify each and every offender identify their risk level, we assign them inmate housing, we keep them productively occupied, we supervise them. Those are all very important things. And those computers that you put right out in the open that control all the doors in here doesn't get disturbed. Because now we've created that invisible barrier. And we tell the inmates barriers and boundaries are everywhere in life. And it's when you can't respect an invisible barrier that you're going to have trouble. So there's no glass, no steel, no metal from keeping you from coming here. But I'll tell you something, if you come across this line, your classification is going to change and your life is going to get worse in jail. So that's how we begin to rehabilitate people and their thinking so that when they get released and they know that there's no barrier <coughs> between me and this thing that I want, but I can't do it. We teach that now with direct supervision. Direct supervision has resulted in all of these following phenomena. There have been fewer assaults on inmates. There have been fewer assaults on staff. Fewer suicides. Fewer inmate disturbances. Reduced liability for the, the local jurisdiction. Less destruction of property because you have an officer in there all the time. You have a better opportunity to rehabilitate those offenders because you're with them all the time, and you can ramp up your programming. It makes perfect sense. This is an example of linear intermittent design. This is a picture of uh, the jail in Westmoreland, the first phase. So you're looking down a corridor. Now, if you're a correctional officer right now, you cannot see inside any one of these cells. Right here is a camera. That camera is looking back this way, but of course it can only see anything that's in the hallway. It can't see inside. So that's an example of linear intermittent. And these cells were designed for one person, and we've had up to three of them. Here you can see the bunk on the floor, bunk here, and then there's an upper bunk that you can't see. Here you see bunks out into the day room living area. And this is a podular remote part of the institution. Here you get a good look at what's really happening in Westmoreland. There's been so many flooding uh, from inmate toilets upstairs, maximum security is above here, that all the ceiling tiles have been degraded and replaced so many times, we don't even replace them anymore. 
Now the roof leaks and the plumbing leaks. Here you get an example of where we have to double or triple up on different things in small areas. This is actually by design the cafeteria where inmates are supposed to eat. And then of course we have these computers here for programming. Now taxpayers don't buy these computers. Inmates buy these computers. Taxpayers don't buy televisions in the jail that I manage. Inmates buy the televisions in the jail that I manage. The only thing that taxpayers pay for in a jail that I manage are things that you have to pay for by law. If an inmate doesn't require it by law, a taxpayer is not paying for it. So we have TVs in the new jail, but the inmates paid for those TVs. They paid for those TVs because we have a canteen service where they can buy soda, potato chips, candy bars, all kinds of junk food to help the already bad teeth that they have. They spend lots of money on this. We make about a 15 or 20 percent profit. That profit goes into a, an account specific for inmate programs. So if they need basketballs, it comes out of that account. If they need TVs, it comes out of that account. Anything that we want them to have but they're not required to have comes out of that account. So we hold a program here. Right here, you can't see it in this picture, but that's the shower area. So now you've got a shower, uh, a, a nasty, dirty inmate that's just been admitted in the same area where you eat food. But you can't do that during programming. You see the problem? Mm -hmm. And this is what we faced in Westmoreland for many years. This is a snapshot of our control room. So this gives you an idea of how it's been cannibalized. Originally in the design, there were monitors in here. So we've had to bring in new multiplexers because technology changes. All these wires come out of conduits. This is a one correctional officer station. You can see the control panel here, which if you were to flip this up, you'd see, like, and I'm making this up, bubble gum, duct tape, you know, band-aids, holding wires together on the other side of that panel. Uh, I'm not making this up. You come into the control room every once in a while, there'll be some smoke coming out of there. That's absolutely true. Uh, and we flip that up, put the fire out real quick. Have to go to Keys for a couple of days until we get maintenance to figure that out. Um, but you can see how antiquated uh, the jail became. These buttons are now useless. They serve no purpose. Here we've got five visiting booths for 132 inmates. And they only have one hour on weekends in which to visit and 30 minutes during the week. So it's bottlenecked. So everybody comes at that 30 minute or one hour to see 132 people with five booths. Great fun on visiting day out there. Now, we take a look at the new jail. The new jail increased about 174%. went from 30,000 square feet to 82,000 square feet approximately of usable space. But the staff only increased by 75%. Imagine a, a jail that has so many different compartments, a lot of little rooms, a lot of little rooms. And in every one of those little rooms, is potentially a suicide, an assault, something going on that's not supposed to be going on. The only way that you can effectively manage that is to put people there, put correctional officers there. So in a small building with lots of rooms, that requires lots of people. And if you have to move an inmate from point A to point B, that requires resources and people. So a modern jail design would be a large area with great sight lines. Sight lines are like this room. You can see pretty much everything in this room, although these support structures here compromise my line of sight. So we want to design somehow that would minimize these kind of weight-bearing structures and allow me to see as much as possible. That's the first thing that you want to do for an efficient design. The second thing that you want to do is decentralize your programs and your operations. Centralized means that inmates have to leave the living area and go to eat somewhere else. Well, that requires people to take them. How about if you take inmates from here and you go to a visit? That requires resources. But if we could eat here, visit here, recreate here, go to school here without leaving, we don't need any more than the one correctional officer that's there already. And that's how we make a design much more efficient operationally. And that's what we did with the new jail and key. I've done a staffing pattern analysis. I've done a staffing pattern analysis because my first concern is I want to prevent having too many staff. My big challenge for the budget that just passed on Monday night is do I have enough money to do this? 
Do I have enough people? I don't know. We've never been in this jail. We've never operated this jail. So we, we take a scientific approach. We try to put it on paper. We try to make sure that we have enough people to make sure that we're safe and secure. But what I want to do is make sure that I don't hire too many. I want to prevent having too few, obviously, or having the wrong kind of staff. The wrong kind of staff would be somebody who is a trained correctional officer who has the defensive tactics, the, the, uh, the knowledge to use handcuffing, the knowledge to use all these special equipment that we give them, but yet they're supervising an outside work detail with a minimum security inmate where it's very likely that they're not going to do anything wrong. That would be the wrong kind of staff. You have a highly trained person to respond to an unlikely situation. So we want to make sure that the right people are in the right place. That also addresses number four. Efficient scheduling practice is very important to make sure that we know what the minimum number of officers are required to, to have a safe institution. Now we look at a snapshot in history. We started this presentation in 1997 saying we're going to need to do something. We're at 13 years right now. And we will occupy in the second quarter of 2010. So it took 13 years for this opportunity of my 18 to get this done. Now, one of the things that hurts me quite a bit as a taxpayer is we could have done the same square footage for $15.5 million in 2001. But because of the delay, because of inflation, because of cost increases. And in the latter part, up in here, 2006, 2007, when there was indecision, we contacted the architect and said, how much is the delay costing us? And the cost estimator put pen to paper and said, $100,000 a month. So you can keep putting it off. We started putting it off in 1997. You can keep putting it off. But every time you do, it goes up another hundred grand. And I felt that was something that your lawmakers ought to know. Take your time at $100,000 a month. It's not going to go back to $15 million. But it will continue to go up $100,000 a month. And that was one of the points that helped move this project along. The original bond vote was for $37 million. That changed because at the time, fuel oil was at $4.80-something cents a gallon. And so we called up the architect and the engineers and said, uh, by the way, how much fuel is this thing going to burn? 94,000 square feet. They said, not sure, probably about 70,000 gallons a year at $4.85. So we went back to the delegation and said, we'd really like to consider geothermal for this because we're a community that cares about our environment, first of all. We're a community that doesn't want to spend $4.85 on fuel oil. We're a community that doesn't want to go into the future dependent on fossil fuels. And the delegation said, sure. And they gave us more money. So now we have a geothermal system. Not only do we have an intelligent design and a significantly high quality built department, but it will also be efficiently run. It, it is one of the things that is going to be remarkable in the Northeast, this jail. So here are some stats about what we do. Uh, obviously not in the new jail, but from where we've come from. And some of these, some of this data is a little bit old, but you get the idea. 30% of inmates are high school graduates. Only 20% receive GED before admission. 50% do not have a high school education upon admission. So I challenge my program staff to go after that. If you know that half of them don't have a high school education, let's try and do that. Because some of these kids can actually take a test and get a GED. And if we can do that, let's help them out with it. And we do charge them for it. Because that's the world. Oh, and by the way, I have a medical copay. Okay, so if you got a headache and you want a Tylenol, that's going to cost you. It's like 40 cents. You say, boy, that's expensive. I said, I've never been to the hospital, have you? <laughs> you get a Tylenol there. But we have a medical copay. If you, if you go down and see the doctor, it costs you five bucks. You know, it's going to cost you to go see the nurse. 
like it does us. Sixty percent of the inmates are on prescribed medications. In 2006, it cost just the medications alone I'm talking about here, not medical, just medications. It was equivalent to $751 per inmate per year. 32% were diagnosed with a mental illness. In these two bullets, if you can't read it, the state is reducing assistance for mentally ill inmates. I think we all know that, not only for inmates, but they're doing it for the public in general. And we need enhanced mental health services. And we're very fortunate. We have a full-time mental health clinician on staff. We also have a full-time caseworker on staff. And those are two significant additions in recent years to what we can do. 10% of our population test positive for TB. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they have TB. It means they've been exposed to it. 4% uh, had a positive x-ray. Uh, that's a serious issue. Now, the taxpayer in our county pays for this TB test. For everybody, 100%. You have to take it. You don't have a choice. You come into our jail, I'm going to stick you for TB. <laughs> and if you refuse to be stuck for TB, I'm going to put you in close confinement until you do. Why do I do that? Because if TB comes to our community, it's probably going to show up in jail first. It's going to show up there first. And so I'm going to want to make sure the CDC is aware of that and all public health officials are aware of that if it comes to the community. So I stick everybody for TB. Now, if we have an active case, and you can see here we've had 4% with a positive x-ray, which still doesn't mean they're active. If they have a positive x-ray, they go to a next step. We haven't had anybody that was actually contagious with TB. Thank goodness. But if we did, the new jail has a quarantine cell. We put a negative pressure ABF quarantine cell in there so that somebody who has H1N1 or tuberculosis would not infect the rest of the population. We have no active TB that's been encountered, but the threat is increasing in the inmate population. Our medical expenses, and you can see this is back in 2006, just to give you an idea, 202000 <coughs> Last year, it was significantly more than that because we had one inmate who came to jail <clears throat> undiagnosed, we diagnosed the symptomology and discovered he had testicular cancer. He was in jail on two misdemeanor charges. So we went to the prosecutor and said, would you consider dropping these charges, letting the guy out because he's really sick? And by the way, costing us a ton of money. No, 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 no. In the name of justice, we have to prosecute this young man. Okay. $100,000 later, $100,000 later for this one inmate, eight months later, goes back to court and the court says, my, you are really sick, time served. <laughs> wow. You know, I was kind of hoping to dodge that bullet several months ago. Okay? But those are the kinds of things that happen. We have no insurance. Jails cannot buy insurance for medical care. We pay cash. So because we pay cash, I go to the hospital and say, you live in Keene? And most of them say, yes, I do. And I say, how are your taxes? And they said, they're pretty steep. And I'm like, can we talk? <laughs> Let's work something out here. Because this is taxpayer money. And so talk we do. And we have a great arrangement. We have an arrangement where we get like Medicaid rate plus 10% or something like that, which is very helpful to the taxpayer. We don't have to pay retail like we did years ago. As far as programs, we have over a hundred volunteers that want to come out and help us provide programs. We have to turn a lot of them away because we simply don't have the space to do it in the old jail. In the old jail, we're able to somehow squeeze 40 volunteers in there for 12 ongoing programs. Some of those programs are like effective parenting, starting a small business, balancing your checkbook, things like that, things, good life skills. 60% of the inmates indicate that they want to participate in programming upon admission. Isn't that wonderful? Because that's really what you want to, that's really what you want to hear, you know? But only 12% actually do. And that's the bummer. So uh, it's not about marketing. This is the kind of thing where inmates get in there and now they've got to act like inmates, like I was talking about earlier. So our job in a new direct supervision facility is going to prevent that. Not going to let them act like an inmate and say, you have the benefit right now of some time. 
and you can use that time to change your life. And that's what we're going to try to do. Here's some labor that we've done for the community. We have four inmates. We've adopted two miles of road out there for a litter cleanup in Westmoreland. We're likely to do that somewhere in Keene around the new jail. By the way, for any of you in the room that ever need some free labor, and you're a municipality, you have to be a nonprofit. We have free labor for you. Okay? Uh, we have provided labor to the Cooperative Extension. 19 inmates have provided uh, labor to the Keene <coughs> Transfer Station. We've done a lot of cleanup along the dome. And if somebody else has, has uh, adopted that for litter cleanup, but because of the wind, it's always nasty. So we've, we've helped out quite a bit. And we've provided over 1,500 hours to the Cheshire Fairgrounds. Over half of them don't have work when they come to jail. This takes a, a look at some of the jurisdictions and where inmates come from jurisdictionally. So there was a lot of uh, towns that were saying, unfair, unfair, don't want the jail in my town when we were looking for sites, which, by the way, we looked at over 52 sites to site this particular jail before we decided on where it is. But you can see that he, by far, uh, is our biggest customer. And again, this is 2006. We booked 1,300 inmates. We booked as many as 1,700. This just gives you a breakdown of some of the reasons why people are there. Interesting to note that it's about two and a half charges mathematically per individual. Now, there's one more thing I'd like to do before we conclude it, and I'm going to show you some pictures of the new jail that I brought. And uh, while, while that runs, I will be happy to entertain any questions that you have, if I can do this. As much as possible. Uh, I like to walk around the institution. And uh, that does several things. One of the things that it does is it allows me to keep my finger on the pulse of what my staff is doing or not doing. So for example, I went around the uh, day before yesterday. I went around every day room in Westmoreland. And I have a little pad with me. And I talked with all the inmates. And I discovered that they hadn't had laundry change in four days. And that's a concern to me. And so I immediately went to my staff and said, what the hell's going on? Why aren't we, why aren't we getting laundry more quickly? And then they began to tell me what they're doing to remediate the problem. But had I not gone to the inmates, I wouldn't have known that. That's no disrespect to my staff. They think they're doing what they can to get it done. <coughs> Here you're seeing shots of the geothermal system inside the institution. This is an example of uh, one of the day rooms general uh, open day rooms. Look at the line of sight. You can stand anywhere in there and see anywhere uh, as compared to the older pictures <coughs> that we saw. And this area here is the correctional officer's control station. That's what it looks like behind there. So you have a computer right out there. This is the visitation station. So they will visit by video, handset, and see them on a screen. The kitchen. We built the kitchen, the geothermal, and all the infrastructure systems large enough that in the future, if we had to build an addition, it will support it. So we could actually build 127 additional beds, if we had to, for minimal dollars. We have two dates that I'd like to give you. April 12th and 13th are tour dates open for the public. April 12th and 13th, starting at around 10 o'clock in the morning, going to around 6 o'clock in the evening. If you show up between that time, we will give you a footprint of the jail, and it's a self-guided walking tour. How much more fun can you have than that? <laughs> and so you walk through this jail, and we'll have people in there to help guide you through. 12th and 13th of April, between 10 and 6. Can we go down to the boiler room and so on? Absolutely. The entire institution will be open for you, and, and we'll have some people uh, around that will answer questions to the best of their ability. Uh, if you're an engineer and you're going to ask us about geothermal, you're not going to get much out of us because we don't know much. Uh, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. Yes, sir. What will be the visiting hours in the jail? So Unlimited. Okay. How will that work? It, it works uh, in a wonderful way because, because it's video and it's recorded, audio-visual, the visitors never get beyond the lobby. The inmates never leave their living area. So it doesn't require an officer to do visiting the way it does in Westmoreland. We've, we've uh, decentralized the visiting procedure. 
So now we can say, starting at 8 o'clock in the morning and going until 9 o'clock at night, seven days a week, any time you'd like to come and visit, please feel free to do so. Now what we've avoided is the bottleneck. Rather than say, visiting is from 10 to 12, everybody shows up at 10, and you try to get them through by 12. We don't have to do that now with this system. So when you release that bottleneck and you open it seven days a week, people are now peppered throughout the week, and it makes it very infrequent and very manageable. And that's the kind of approach that we took to the design of the building and the operational efficiency of the staff. By doing that, it costs less money for us. Uh, it, see, my, my realization was this, that the cost of this jail, the $38.5 million bond, is the least expensive part of it. The most expensive part associated with this jail is the operating costs forever. And so, my point was to make sure that it was operationally efficient. I wanted the operational cost as low as possible, contrary to other modern jails where the operating cost is pretty significant. If you look at other jails, other county jails, and there have been brand new ones built within the last few years, and you look at the number of inmates that they have versus the number of staff that they have, and we're going to blow them away hands down. We're going to be so much more cost efficient across the board, operationally, mechanically, and every way possible. And that's what I think you pay me to do. I've, I've known Rick for a long time. He comes and speaks, or we go actually to him for our leadership and Anon program. And he and his staff are always incredibly accommodating. Um, and we've all learned a great deal from, from working with him. So thank you for joining us. And I'm sorry you didn't get any sleep last night. I remember those days. Sleeping is a sign of weakness. <laughs> Um, I want to thank the Mananak Radio Group, um, who is the, the sponsor, and Bethany Commons. Patrick is over here. Uh, Patrick Korstold will take you on a tour if you have not seen one of the apartments here um, or, or the common space other than the one that we're in. Um, so please see him after. A um, couple of announcements on Friday, April 2nd. From 8 to 11, we'll have a training and development workshop, and it will uh, focus on your computer network security. So uh, Steve Ryder from True North Networks will be presenting that, and if you're interested, talk to me about that. Uh, our next business after hours is April 21st, and it's at Stonewall Farm from 5.30 to 7.30. It's open to all chamber members, but if you have a potential um, new member that you'd like to introduce, let us know and bring them along. Also on April 21st, at Stonewall Farm, during the, the um, business after hours, there will be a free demonstration of a five minute networking program. You need to sign up in advance for that we are taking, uh, there, I think there will be 15 people, right Scott? Yeah. 15, 15 people rotating at five minute intervals um, in this networking activity. It's, this one is free um, and we are taking signups. We have a few slots left, but not a 15 lot. 15 from Sherm and 15 from the Chamber is Thank the you. goal. Better to ask somebody who knows instead of who's just reading the paper. Um, our next breakfast forum is April 28th here at Bentley, and it will be the four college presidents of, of our four area post-secondary institutions, Keene State College, Antioch, uh, River Valley Community College, and Franklin Pierce. And we're going to have a discussion, a panel discussion, on how the colleges are meeting our current workforce needs, our business needs, and sort of dialogue with them about what they need to do and how we can help them. Um, so. I think that's it for today. Rick, thank you again thank you for much. joining Appreciate us. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you to Bentley Commons. And uh, have a great day. <laughs>